Okay, testing. Good. We are on. We're going to talk about groundwater, and uh, then after we get done talking, we're going to go down to lab and kind of do a little lab over this. So if you're watching at home, you can answer your groundwater lecture quiz question here in a second, and then do the rest of the lab quiz when we get downstairs with you. Okay, who can tell me, what do you think these circles are here? Their crops are, obviously it's from aliens, right? Yeah. yeah. At least that's what the government would have us believe. They're definitely aliens. Or rather, we've got one in the next job on History Channel. Yeah, don't watch the History Channel. It's oh, no longer science on the History gear. Channel. It's they got the crazy don't, don't watch that that's stuff. It's no longer science. <laughs> it's no longer science. Okay. My dad loves that guy. Let's explain these things for real, because they do, do look really cool when you're flying in an airplane. Um, what's going on here? This is actually in Jordan. This is in the desert. Now, we are farming in the desert. Now, t really, farming in the desert, apart from being kind of difficult, is kind of dumb environmentally. It's very, very wasteful because there's no water there. So the water is coming from the center of these little circles. There's a pipe that goes underground, and they're pumping it up. And if you look carefully, you'll see these little metal lines. There's like one on each of these. That little thing moves around in a circle on wheels, and it's a sprinkler. And it sprays the crops. Where well, this one runs into the mountain. It has to turn around and go the other way. That's why you get a half pie shape there. So they are farming. We do this as well here in the United States. Uh, it's tremendously wasteful because once you remove all that groundwater, once it's gone, uh, then you have no water underground. And it's kind of important stuff. So we're mostly going to talk about groundwater today. Groundwater is super important stuff. Uh, it is the water that's underground as opposed to the surface water. So if you look at a lake or a stream or a river or anything like that, that's surface water. It's on the surface, like the The groundwater, a couple of characteristics about it, it can be in unconsolidated stuff. Unconsolidated stuff is just like sand and gravel, like loose stuff. Or it can be an actual rock itself. Like yes, it moves through rock. Some rocks it moves through better than other rocks. Okay. So the saturated zone, whether it's unconsolidated or rock, is just where there's sitting water. Uh, the unsaturated zone is what the water sinks through, settles through, to get to the saturated zone. And the top of the saturated zone is called the water table. Um, it's not perfectly flat, but it is kind of table-like. We'll, we'll find out more about that a little bit later. The water table, notice, intersects with the lake or the stream or the river. So how far is Columbus out of the water table? It's not far. You don't have to dig far around here to hit water because the river is right there. It's also why we flood a lot. The water table is very high here in Columbus. Um, yeah, so I think that's what I want to say about that. Anyway, any questions about that? Cool, we're gonna talk groundwater. Okay, the first thing that you're gonna need to know because we're going to do this down lab, it's on your quiz, is about porosity. And it almost seems so simple, it bear, hardly bears mentioning. But porosity is the spaces between the rocks. So if it's gravel, it's the spaces between the gravel. If it's something like an igneous rock, the spaces, the little cavities are very tiny. They're microscopic, you can't even see them. They're so small, right? If it's something like sandstone, it has spaces, bigger pockets. They might be hard to see, but it does have pockets between the, the, the solid rock. So the greater the porosity of a material, the easier the water moves through it, right? Duh, bigger holes, it's like a sponge. Water can move through it a whole lot easier. And we can look at some different things. Like limestone water moves through quite well. Uh, sandstone, it moves through pretty well. Uh, especially if it's well sorted, we'll get to that in a second. Some of this harder stuff like granite, some of these igneous rocks, it doesn't move through very well at all. In fact, if I had clay up here, which I don't, it very, very poorly moves through clay. Clay is almost a perfect like barrier, in fact. So we sometimes line things with clay. Hey, <laughs> we're doing a little quiz here, so if you pull out your thing, you can follow up. Okay, so porosity. We will do an experiment with this downstairs. There's another piece that goes along with porosity, and it's called permeability. The two go hand in hand. Permeability is just how interconnected the openings are. So see the little connections between the pockets? So you kind of have to have both. You need big openings and you need connections between them and that's how water can move through. And so we're going to look at some of these comparisons down in lab to figure out what water moves through the fastest and how it moves easiest and what stops it. Okay. Um, this is some fairly, not poorly sorted stuff. It's very angular and it's got some very narrow passages, but there's passages for water to go through. 
Did you know that? Did you know that if like you took a piece of sandstone, like actual stone, carved a little depression in it, and filled it with water, like if it doesn't evaporate, it's going to soak into the stone itself and slowly drip out the bottom side. Can it, was, do that? it just it takes a while. <laughs> I actually thought about trying to set up weird little experiments with a very thin slice like that. I don't know how long it would take or if we could do it, but it'd be kind of fun. We should do it. It'd be kind of interesting. It'd be a lot of work for me though. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe one of these days. But things like limestone, even shale, it'll move through that stuff. You can even see that. Some of that rock's kind of absorbent. You can, it like soaks up water a little bit. But something like granite, boy, it does not want to move through that. Or clay, if we want to trap water, we line something with clay and it cannot get through that clay. Okay? It really confines it. Which brings us to the most important part for here for today. This is where you can answer that first, that question, the second question on the lab, on not the lab quiz, the, the lecture quiz. So if you're on the lecture quiz, it says lecture quiz, 1.2 groundwater. Uh, we're going to describe the answer to that right here. It's got a question about aquifers. So just about everything I'm talking about today is contained in this picture. There's a lot of words up here. If you learn a couple of them, it's going to make way more sense. Yes. Is that for artesian? Yep, that's it. Should be about artesian wells. Oh, okay. okay. Yep, artesian wells. That's the question. So we're going to describe it right here first. So first of all, there's two terms up here. One is called a confined aquifer, and one's called a unconfined aquifer. Okay. There's water in both of those. Now, they could be unconsolidated sedimenty stuff. More than likely, they're solid rock like that sandstone or it's limestone, something water can move through, it might move through really slowly, like days or years or decades. Like it could take hundreds of years for it to move through this rock, but it's down there moving through this rock. Okay. So some of you guys, uh, I asked you the question about where does your water come from? Where did you guys think your water came from? Anybody have any ideas? What do you think? Yeah. The water treatment plant. The water treatment plant, all right. So it's. Water doesn't actually come from the treatment plant that treats our sewage, but there is another treatment plant that treats it to make sure it's safe to drink. But yeah, our sewage gets eventually dumped back out into the river after it's treated. Ugh. Yeah, I know. What about the water we drink? Comes from the creek? Actually, none of Columbus's water actually comes from surface water. It, it doesn't. All of your water in Columbus is from underground, there are a couple of different wells around town. I think one's out by the airport. Uh, and then there's plants out there that treat it after it's pumped up out of the ground. So this is extraordinarily pertinent to us because all the water we drink comes from this type of scenario, okay? Um, we don't have an artesian system here, by the way. Ours is the unconfined one, which we're gonna talk about, which is a little bit more dangerous. So our water comes from that type of a situation. Um, did anybody say from out of their faucet? Somebody always sits out of my faucet. <laughs> I'm not going to count it wrong, but uh, right, what we're looking for is like where it really comes from. Other places do get their water from open sources. Bloomington gets most of its water from Lake Monroe, so it comes right out of the lake and they treat it. If you've ever slammed in Lake Monroe, they might find that kind of gross. Um, but either way, we have to be careful of pollution and the systems react differently. So let's kind of describe what we've got going on here. There are a couple of confining units. There's this gray area on the bottom and a gray area in the middle that is a material that water can't get through. That is known as an aquitard, okay? Because it slows the motion of water. That's where it gets its name from. So what is that? It could be, maybe it's granite. More than likely, it's something like clay. It's some material that water can't get through very well at all, so it gets trapped. And what happens in the unconfined aquifer is water falls onto the land and it actually, it seeps. It permeates through the soil, through the even the rock, the sand, the, everything else, and it fills up like a bathtub down here. It fills up to a certain level that we call the water table. Now, if you dig a hole down there, there's not a lake that you could swim in. It's solid rock, but there's a lot of water down there, okay? So we drill wells, like we drill wells. Does anybody around here have a well? Yeah, awesome. Does the well water taste any different than the water here? No, really, that's pretty cool. Well, not the school water tastes like water, but. Yeah, the school water tastes heavily chlorinated, doesn't it? It tastes kind of irony, too. We've got a lot of iron in our pipes. Yep. For a while, the local water, for quite a while in my house. Yep. So I don't really like 
the, the school water either. I think it tastes very chlorinated. Um, so I always bring my water from home. But uh, anyway, when you drill down and hit this water, you can then start pumping it back up. Okay, now how do you know where to drill? It's kind of tricky, and that's why we have hydrogeologists, because the water table is a funny thing, right? It's not stuck in place. It can rise, it can lower. You definitely want to be deep enough that it doesn't go below your well, because it can make your water taste really bad, or it could even go dry. And it's expensive to drill deeper, so you don't want to drill too much deeper than you have to. So we do pay people lots of money to figure this out. Now how do we know? It's tricky business. Um, we don't walk around with divining rods anymore going, oh, I feel some water over here, I feel some water. Right? Nowadays we have more, more high-tech methods, but really what we know comes from all the holes we've dug. We've drilled a lot of holes. And so we have a pretty good of idea of what the water's doing down there. But anyway, back to our diagram. As the water fills up up here, it's in this unit called the unconfined aquifer. What happens if somebody spills pollution up here on the surface? Where is it going? Down to the unconfined It's going down to the unconfined aquifer eventually. Is it going to get into the confined aquifer? No. no, this thing's protected, which is what makes an artesian system kind of unique. Watch how the artesian system works, okay? The artesian system is recharged oftentimes from maybe hundreds of miles away. It can be far, far away from the source. Water falls over a small area where the rocks dip upwards, like this, okay? So it gets trapped and it creates pressure because higher water has more pressure from the gravity forcing it downwards, pulling it downwards. And all this stuff down underneath to here is under pressure. Well, it's got nowhere to go. So when you drill a hole from the surface and you puncture through into this confined layer, into this uh, confined aquifer, it literally will shoot out of the top of the pipe. It's so cool. I'll tell you what, I, I went to school in northern Wisconsin, right on Lake Superior, and the Lake Superior syncline, the whole basin, the rock around Lake Superior is dipped. It, it dips towards the lake and it goes way deep underground, okay? So there's layers that are confining like this. So far away, like hundreds of miles away, rain falls, and it builds up pressure back there and it migrates through the rock all the way to the edge of Lake Superior. And where I went to school, they had actually drilled holes down near the edge of the lake far enough to pierce through the confined aquifer. And water is literally shooting out of these pipes. They put a little gooseneck on it so it points down and they shoot up in the air. But you can walk there and fill up your water jugs. And everybody did because our, our pipes were full of lead. It's really bad to drink the city, city water. So everybody all year long, even the winter time, you can go there and just fill your water jug. If there's icicles on everything, you stick your water jug under there. It's really clean. It could be hundreds, it could be millions of years old water underneath of there. It's not polluted. Now the only way this could get very polluted is if somebody dumps something over here, right? Then obviously it can get in. But really, a confined aquifer in an artesian system, you can describe how that forms and like what's going on there. That can be some of the most purest water that you can get around. Has anybody had water from like a, a, a bottle at the gas station that says artesian spring water? Yeah, so uh, chances are it's not really from an artesian spring. That's like one of those, like we bought the name artesian and we trademarked it. So. <laughs> You're not necessarily really getting artesian water. It's probably just tap water that they cleaned and like put in a bottle. Like, so don't think it's really special water. It probably isn't, right? And, and this isn't really special water either, other than that it's much cleaner than the other water we could be getting and much less susceptible to pollution. So you can pay more money for that water, but it's probably the same water that you get out of your tap, more than likely. <laughs> Maybe it doesn't have as much chlorine in it. Right. So take a second to answer that question. Oh, there's also a perched aquifer up here. It's kind of neat. So sometimes you get a little bit of material that's, that's an aquitar that doesn't let the water through, and you get a little, little patch of water sitting up there. So some folks don't have to drill as deep to get water if they find one of those. So our situation in Columbus is, for the most part, this unconfined aquifer. Anything anybody spills on the surface is going down into our groundwater. That's why you see things like uh, signs and stuff like that saying, you know, don't dump your used motor oil on the ground because it's eventually going in our drinking water, right? If the stuff you put on the ground goes down there, what well, doesn't run off right directly into the streams and rivers and things? Okay. Everybody got that? Is that good? Okay. Let's move on a little bit here. 
So looking at those confined, I think we already said this, but a confined aquifer where you can drill down and actually make yourself um, an artesian spring or an artesian well, uh, it's going to be cleaner water, more than likely, because it's protected from all that pollution that could come in from the surface. Right? And even if pollution did come in, it's traveling through a lot of rock before it gets to you. So it's getting filtered. Okay, so contamination is a lot less likely. Let's talk about the water table. So any place where water intersects the land is probably the water table. That's why I said in Columbus, we're really close to the water table. The river is right here. Um, this picture over here, this is my buddy, uh, this is my buddy Jocko right here. He painted his name on the rock. That's him right there in the air. If you look close, you see him. So he's worried he's going to break his neck jumping off of this thing. He dive off the top of this quarry. I found this quarry one day. I was walking in the woods in northern Wisconsin. And I came out of the woods and I found this humongous quarry. So a quarry is where they mine rock, an open quarry like this. We have these all over Indiana. And the water is oftentimes really pure and really clean. When they're mining this rock, what they have to do is they're, they're literally cutting out sections. You can see where they cut here along this edge. They removed all this rock. They removed another big block of rock here. And it goes down, 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 down. In fact, I've been diving in this quarry many times. It's over 60 feet deep, the water. Not holding my breath with scuba gear. Can't hold my breath that long. I'm not that good. But uh, the water is very, very clean and pure. It's been filtered by all this rock that it's going through. It's very cold. But imagine if you're mining in that, in order to keep digging rocks out, you have to have pumps down there. You've got to keep pumping the water out while you're trying to cut the rock out or the darn thing fills up with water because it's seeping through the rock and coming out. Hey, need somebody? Yeah. Uh, uh, Davey. Pass it. Okay. So, uh, oh, you've all experienced this. Have you guys ever dug a hole at the beach and hit water? And then if you go a little further up, up shore or up the beach and dig a hole, you gotta dig a little deeper, don't you? Right? It's partly because that you went up in elevation a little bit, but the water table doesn't perfectly flat. It kind of follows the landscape a bit. Right? But you dig it and it's kind of it's like flat down there. You hit like water just fills up to one level and it stops. So you hit the water table when you did that. Okay, so all those places are at the water table. Let's take an in-depth look here at what it looks like. You would think that it's perfectly flat like a table, but it's just not. It actually kind of follows the landscape. And that's what gives the flow of groundwater such unique properties. Now, these H's here stand for hydraulic head. So that's basically water pressure. So the, the blue dashed line is the water table. And if you look, it's not flat across there like you might think. It actually goes up the hill. It's underground, right? But it kind of goes back down. So when it rains, this stuff fills with water and it sinks into the ground and it fills up to this level and this fluctuates. Well, because it's not flat, it causes it to move in really weird ways. So the water up here at H1 is actually gonna move downwards because of pressure towards H2 in kind of a curved arc and come back up by the lake here. You wouldn't expect it. So this causes some interesting things to happen. If you're worried about pollution moving underground, um, it's not gonna move in a straight line. It may not even move in your direction at all. It can be very bizarre how this stuff moves and very tricky to figure out. Um, but it does move in a sort of arc pattern. I'll show you a picture of it here. So you can see where it's filling up, it's, it's trickling down through the soil and whatnot on top of this little mountain range here. And it goes down into the rock and it goes down and it comes back up near the creek here, or the river. You can almost think of it like there's all this pressure up top here, and somebody pulled the plug by the river. And it's just like coming out. It's come, feel, coming back out right there. Have you ever walked alongside of a creek and suddenly felt a really cold spot in the gravel or the sand? Like dug your feet in, maybe it was kind of quicksandy, and you feel water kind of coming up right there? That's exactly what's happening. Groundwater is pushing its way up into the creek, and it's cold. It's colder than the rest of the creek. You can feel it. So like yeah. when you're swimming at a lake and you mm -hmm. find a cold patch, is that what that cold patch is? It could be, but not always. It yeah. could just be cold water from down below that got stirred up, because the water down deeper is colder. Yeah. If you swam down, you're like, whoa, it gets really cold, right? Swim down far enough, it's really, really cold. So this is how groundwater moves. I know you're kind of probably thinking, like, why are we talking so much about groundwater? 
Groundwater is really important because it's our drinking water, but also if things kind of clear up and maybe we get some vaccines going, I'd like to take you to explore some things that form from groundwater that we call caves. And so that's kind of where Hamling's going with all this. Not that I love groundwater that much, but since it forms caves, I think it's pretty cool and I like to drink it. Um, so yeah. keeps me alive. It keeps us alive, right? So these things flow in these weird kind of curvy paths and we'll try and model some of this downstairs you get some weird situations. And one of those can be uh, things like an oasis in the desert. So how in the world do you get trees growing in the middle of a desert? Well, you get rain far, far away, maybe hundreds of miles away, and it seeps into the ground. It eventually makes its way into rock and travels through the rock. Because of the pressure situation, it's gonna travel towards an area of lower pressure. As it travels, eventually it might hit a crack in that rock, a fault, maybe an earthquake <laughs> happened and a big fault crack goes down into the ground, it will follow its way up that crack and suddenly spill out on the surface. And now there's a bunch of trees. So that's how an oasis might form in the desert. It could, the water could be coming from far, far away and then it just kind of comes out. Let's talk about tapping this groundwater. Um, some of you guys said you had wells. If you've got a well, um, who said they had a well? Yeah, do you guys drink it? Is it like your actual drinking water? Yeah. So, awesome. So do you get it tested every year or not? You don't know. So if you have a well, you should get it. I think they recommend getting it tested every year. But uh, a lot of people don't. And I'm not saying that's not safe, but uh, here's, what, here's some things that can happen. Let's say you drill a well. And like I said, it's expensive to drill a well down. And you start pumping some water, like for your house. And a farm moves in next door or a farm puts in a deeper well next door because they need more water, they want to expand and pump that water out and spray it on their fields, right? When you pump water out of the ground, it doesn't just kind of lower the whole water table like going down, it makes a cone. It lowers it in this cone of depression. And if they pump enough water out, that cone will intersect with the other well and suddenly the house in the, in the picture there has no water. And what do you do? Like it's all underground, like who do you sue? You like call up the police and say, hey, the guy next to me pumped all the water out. I've got no water to drink. No, it's more like, so sorry. Looks like you're going to have to spend hundreds and hundreds more dollars to drill a dig deeper hole and pump water out. So uh, this can cause some big expenses for folks if the water table gets depressed like that and pushed down. We're going to model this downstairs a little bit. And it can lead to lots of conflicts between farmers and between house owners and things like that. Yeah. Well, before we got switched Getting water at my house, our well was our <coughs> only source of water. Was it? Yeah. Yes, yeah, it's, it's like that for lots of folks. Totally. And well water is totally fine. You just have to be careful with it. So, uh, how does the water get to your house? Did anybody say in their in their response there it comes from the water tower? I don't know. So, water towers in the city are how we get water pressure. So the wells out like near the airport and places like that. They pump it up, they clean it, and they put it in these big, huge towers. I know you've seen these water towers before. I've right? lived by one. You've lived by one, yeah. I had some friends climb one one time and get arrested. You're not supposed to climb those, right? <laughs> so don't climb water towers. Actually, I actually repelled off one, but I had permission, so it was okay. So I climbed up one and jumped off with a rope. Pretty fun stuff. Um, but what's going on up here is that this is essentially a big tub of water. And we pump more water into it which creates pressure. So you wonder why, have you ever been in a house like where, where you turn on the faucet or you turn on the shower and, and it's trickling out so slow, it's like, can you wash the soap off? Right? Or you go into another house and you turn on the water and it comes out and like takes your skin off. It's like so powerful, it's like ripping your skin off your body. You've experienced this, right? right? Okay, so the reason for that has to do with your distance in elevation from the actual water tower. This is how you get water pressure. So if you live very close to this thing, uh, the water pressure is quite high here. So a little pipe, you're gonna get a lot of pressure out of that thing. The further away you live from this tower, which is why they put these high up on hills, high points, the lower your water pressure until you get so far away that the water can't even make it up to your second story house or can't get into your house at all. And you have to install a separate pump to give it more pressure to bring it in. But this is how a water, water uh, treatment plant, how it works and how we store the water in these big cisterns. 
kind of weird when you think about that. Like you don't normally really consider like that's why you have water pressure because that thing's so high up in the air. Like that's why they pump that stuff, put it way up there. Kind of neat, huh? Okay. This happens naturally too in nature. This is the Grand Canyon. I've been down that on a raft before. I've seen some of these things going on. It's pretty neat. Water can permeate through the soil and eventually hit an impermeable layer of rock. And then it will slide along that rock and spout out the sides of the canyon and make little waterfalls coming out of the side rather than off the top like where rain would, would send it, right? Um, now, a lot of these would probably be pretty clean and pretty pure to drink out of if it weren't for the fact that the Grand Canyon is the site of a lot of uranium mines. So... Oh probably drink at your own risk, right? I would definitely not drink out of the Colorado River. If you've ever seen that, it's pretty chocolatey. <laughs> not in a good way. Um, it's pretty dirty looking. But anyway, uh, you can oftentimes get springs shooting off the side of a canyon wall like this. Pretty neat. Here's the oasis picture I was talking about. So you've got rain from far away. It can travel underground and eventually maybe hit a fault line or something like that, force its way up and pop bunch of trees come out a little patch of water that's why folks like the Bedouins and people who live in the desert like they know about these locations like historically it's passed down from generation to generation and they know right where to go you know if they're traveling with a camel or something where to hop off and dig a hole and they can actually find water like even if there's no trees there because they know from generation to generation where it actually comes up but this is geologically what's actually happening to it like why it occurs so there's an oasis now, last thing we're going to talk about before we go downstairs is contamination. And this is a big one. This is why we say don't dump stuff on the surface here in Columbus, right? Don't dump it down the sanitary sewers or anything like that. It goes right out into the river because it's going to end up in our water table. It's going to go down there and it's going to move. And it's very hard to track when it's down there and even more difficult to remove. Now, in Indiana, we don't have some of these things so much. We don't have so much have like acid waste from mining and things like that. We do have industry, especially up in Indianapolis, places like that. We do have landfills, which can leak and do sometimes. One of our biggest problems actually in the Midwest, believe it or not, is old abandoned gas stations. What happens to a gas station once it closes down and they leave the tanks underground? Those things rust. And believe me, they don't get all that fuel out. It's not possible. There's still some in there. And that stuff slowly leaches into the groundwater and can be very toxic. And you can't taste it. You can't smell it necessarily. It just travels through the groundwater and then can pop up someplace. And it travels in plumes. You're going to see this down in lab. It, tra it doesn't just like disperse everywhere. It travels in a plume. And it might take 10 years. It might take 100 years. But if that thing hits your well, it contaminates the well. Right? That's why we monitor our wells that we, we pump water out for drinking and we clean it, right? Um, if something like that contaminated, we'd have to shut the well down, find another one somewhere else. Uh, so it's really important we don't contaminate this stuff because you can imagine trying to clean that out. Like, how do you get that out of the ground? That's rock down there. <laughs> like, you can drill more wells and try and pump it out, which is something we do, but it's difficult, right? It's a very big, big problem environmentally. Okay, so we're going to grab our labs here. I'm going to pause this.